Hello, I'm Marcia Cavanaugh. Thanks so much for joining us. Well, in this the week when we remember it's September 11th, one figure who has been elevated in reverence since the event is the firefighter. Coincidentally, the city is trying again to pass a tax for the fire department. We'll look tonight at those who face the heat, both on the front lines and at City Hall. We'll also examine a new plan for gun regulation at the local level, as well as looking for post-flood rebuilding relief and the return of an anti-David Duke political action committee. And our Future Watch segment turns the page on the latest on the New Orleans library system. On the books for us are tonight's Informed Sources. Errol Aboard, producer of Informed Sources. Jeff Adelson, reporter, the New Orleans advocate. Don Ostrom, Channel 12's Future Watch reporter. And Stephanie Grace, columnist, the New Orleans advocate. And we're going to go over to Errol first because um, the city council um, has, and the mayor actually signed a new law regarding new gun regulations in or New Orleans Parish in the city of New Orleans. So you wanted to talk a bit about that. Yeah, well, we all know that guns can't be regulated entirely on the city level, that it's uh, ultimately it's a federal issue. But seeing lack of success on regulation from the federal level, I think cities are trying to do by bits and pieces what they can. And, you know, they can have some minimal impact. Um, the new ordinance, uh, one thing would it do, it would prohibit um, carrying weapons on at recreation playgrounds. That's already illegal and, uh, on schools and in some, in some public places. It would also require gun owners whose guns are stolen to report that the, um, that the guns are stolen. So what impact does, does, does all this have? Um, it could be minimal, but it could have, it's another tool for the police to use. And I, I thought it was interesting that the same weekend that all of this happened, we saw a sentencing in the, um, in the guy who, uh, who did the, uh, the murder last year of the two people along the Mardi Gras parade route. And if you listen to the accounts there, the, the district attorney, is, is, is complaining that they couldn't get a real witness to come out and say it, so they had to put together a package of evidence. And there was one thing that was sure that he was, uh, he fired a gun on the, on the police route. And so it was one more charge that they could put into the package. And ultimately it was a plea deal and he got 45, and he got 45 years, but it was still, it gives them something else. And I think that this would do, uh, what this does too, it just adds, adds to the package of things and you just have to do it um, by bits and pieces. And also on the same week, you know, yesterday we saw uh, a shooting in the neighborhood where six people um, were shot. And so who knows, maybe at some point, had the police had more information about guns that were stolen, maybe it, uh, maybe it could have helped. I know, Jeff, you covered the uh, the path of the ordinances. Is that pretty much the feeling that this is one small step? Yeah, I mean that that was a consistent uh, sort of theme in in a lot of the discussion of this from from council members uh, and uh, and from the mayor's office. I think I think a big part of this is actually what you're talking about that you've now got the smaller charges that can be used to build a case. Um, the, uh, the police have said, you know, it would help them if they knew a gun was stolen and then they could uh, bring theft charges against the person who was carrying it uh, and not all gun owners r report when their guns are stolen. Uh, you've got the, um, uh, the, the Nord Sea facility ban on guns, uh, you know, making playgrounds firearm-free zones, uh, that could could help in some ways. Although there is a pretty big exemption there for uh, for people with concealed carry weapons, um, and, and a lot of that is um, not just the federal. Uh, um, issues with gun control, but the state actually has a lot of restrictions. Uh, the state says that if you're a municipality, you can't pass uh, gun laws that are more restrictive than the state has um, uh, in terms of gun ownership. Uh, so these were all sort of carved out by the administration and the council to sort of fit within uh, existing laws or, or the frameworks of existing laws uh, without without overstepping those. It seems like most, even the most ardent of, of gun supporters would would give in on the idea of, of outlawing guns on playgrounds. Um, you, you know, there, there's actually a lot of support. You know, it, it's worth noting that there was virtually no opposition at the council level uh, to to these ordinances. Uh, the NRA early early on in the introduction. Uh, uh, said that they were opposed to them, but they also sort of said that these are pretty minor things that don't really do much. So I think that that played a role in um, 
there not being a lot of opposition, but there are people out there who say, I should be able to take my gun wherever I want to. It's, it's So as far right. as playgrounds are concerned, the, the Nord playgrounds are concerned, someone who does have a concealed carry permit is allowed to carry. Th that's correct. Yeah, this would only apply to people who are, who are carrying weapons without uh, without a concealed carry permit. So, but in the law, there's also uh, a, a point there. If you are neg neg negligently carrying mm -hmm. this concealed weapon, then you could get into trouble. What does that mean? So the negligent carrying is is sort of an interesting uh, premise. I think the the way that it would mostly be used is if you've got someone who's actually pointing a gun uh, or someone who's carrying around a gun in their hand in a way that, that makes it look like it's either about to go, you know, they might accidentally uh, shoot someone or they might intentionally shoot someone or they might be about to rob someone. Uh, that's, that's really sort of the intent of that. There already was a state law dealing with, uh, dealing with that kind of issue, but that uh, only covered handguns. So this, if in some way, shape, or form, you had a concealed firearm that, that wasn't classified under under handguns. This would now cover that. Um, it's also sort of a little overlapping with some other laws, like uh, aggravated assault, where you're threatening someone and that sort of thing. Okay, so the new gun laws in the city of New Orleans, then signed by the mayor. I'm going to stick with you right now, Jeff. And um, talking about the mayor, the mayor has asked for and council approved putting a fire tax on the ballot that will come up in December. Now, this is something that was tried in the spring of this year, and the voters said no. Can you? Explain what that's about. Yeah, so in the spring, the uh, the voters were asked whether they wanted to uh, put two two taxes on themselves. One was for fire, uh, and one was for police. Um, those would have been about seven and a half mills total, uh, brought in about 26 mil, 26.6 million a year. But in one vote. In, in one vote, yeah. You, you couldn't say, exactly. And we're exactly. talking property tax here, property taxes. We're talking property account. taxes, yes. Um, and so that failed, about 54% of the voters voted against that. Um, they're trying again to get the just the fire tax uh, this time, hoping that it's it's the smaller portion of the tax. It's only 2.5 mills, which is uh, about $25 for every $100,000 of property value. Um, and I think the the city is hoping that that sort of a smaller impact on the tax bill will will sway some votes. There was also I think a lot of concern during the um, uh, the earlier election that. NOPD wasn't going to be using the money uh, it was it would be bringing in effectively. The uh, the administration said this is money that's going to go to, toward hiring cops, but there was a lot of concern at the time about whether they'd be able to meet those recruitment goals and whether they'd really be able to staff up and use the extra you know extra money they were going to be bringing mm -hmm. in. Um, now the fire tax is going toward paying off a uh, 75 million dollar settlement the city uh, has agreed to with the firefighters over back pay. Um, so they're sort of pushing this as this is an important way of um, getting uh, getting the resources we need to pay that settlement without uh, making cuts elsewhere in the budget. And some of it will also go though to pension and can, there's been some issues with the fireman's pension. Yeah, yeah, there has and, and in fact the um, the IG's office was just uh, just wrote a pretty critical uh, report uh, regarding um, uh, an issue with the pensions where some firefighters were collecting their full pensions and getting extra pay for being disabled, uh, which is also something the administration has been hammering on the uh, the firefighters to change. Uh, that's something um, that's still try this the city and the firefighters union are still trying to come to terms on that. So it's not clear where that would be, but that's that's also some savings of a couple couple million dollars that could uh, potentially uh, be used to to bolster the pension system, which is in pretty bad shapes from some pretty bad uh, uh, investments over the past mm -hmm. and some underfunding by the, the Landry administration. Um, but uh, we'll see how that all works out. Could it be argued then that perhaps not as much of a tax increase would be needed? Um, uh, you know, applying to the pension. It's that that gets into some complicated areas. Uh, the as part of the deal with the firefighters, uh, the city is massively increasing its contribution uh, to the pension system. Um, so even even with the the money that would that they could potentially save if they changed uh, the way they're doing this accounting. Um, 
they're still trying to increase the amount of money they're putting in so much that I think the administration probably wouldn't want to back off the tax just because, um, because of it, that. it doesn't cover that. Of course, whether that's, that's the right way to proceed. Well, of course, there's the back pay issue, too, right. which is over... What, decades of back pay? Uh, the, the, that has been in the courts since uh, the early 80s. Uh, so um, this is, uh, the city just made the, the first uh, down payment on that, and they're supposed to be making $5 million payments a year uh, um, for the next uh, about dozen years to, to fully pay it off. Okay, so the fire tax goes back on the ballot, and we will see that in December, which it, will be runoff time for us. Right, they'll right with the uh, the Senate race and and whatever uh, whatever other races make it to runoff. Okay, all righty, Jeff. Thanks a lot. Um, now let's talk about flood relief. If okay. folks, uh, you know, in the Baton Rouge area are, are still suffering from these massive floods, um, and the governor is still hoping to get money from the feds. Yeah. Money from the feds. I think he's maybe starting to feel a little like Kathleen Blanco these days, going back to Washington and back. Mm -hmm. And he went last week, this week. Um, the time frame is very tight because Congress, we know it's an election year. Congress has a lot of business to finish up in September. There's talk that they would, so a lot of them would like to leave earlier, even than scheduled, to get back on the campaign trail. Mm -hmm. They have to um, pass a spending bill to make sure the government doesn't shut down. They have to deal with Zika, you know, money for the Zika right. virus. That's a big research, fight over yeah. Planned Parenthood and you know all the ide ideological stuff that comes out in election year. Um, and then there's little Louisiana <laughs> that kind of needs its money. Um, the governor, he initially asked for about $2 billion worth of aid. It's gone up to $2.8 billion. And that's actually under the guidance of the Obama administration. He's been talking, they've been talking to cabinet secretaries and putting together kind of a more complete ask uh, that involves, you know, a lot of housing relief because so many people didn't have flood insurance. So that would be something like the road home, not mm -hmm. the road home, but something that would be aid for people who, you know, need to get back in their homes. Just more outright grants. Exactly. Um, infrastructure. It, the new letter was interesting. It kind of said not just infrastructure, but resilient infrastructure. Mm -hmm. It almost sounded like Mayor Landrieu. Mm -hmm. that he, um, you know, but they're talking about pumps and, and things that would affect elevation requirements, things that would prevent future events like this. Mm -hmm. um, things like that and it's you know it's tough and and one of the things that's kind of interesting is that you were also seeing some a little bit of pushback against FEMA that we didn't necessarily see at the beginning mm -hmm. Craig Fugate the administrator was here on the ground the immediate response was considered very good they got money into people's hands very quickly but now you know we're starting to see maybe some of what we saw out of Katrina the um the temporary homes, the you know, new enhanced, better right. mobile homes, those are not rolling out quickly at all. Uh, Craig Fugate, the administrator, was invited to testify before Congress. He instead sent an underling, and that did not sit well at all with particularly the Republicans on in Louisiana's delegation, Senator Vitter, who has a committee chairmanship that oversees some of this. So, so, so know, the ask and the ask has grown, as you say, which yeah. you know, with sustainability, certainly that makes sense. I of mean, course. these are areas many of which flooded that had never flooded before. And they were know, not in flood zones. People have been advised you don't have to buy flood insurance. And yet, there's a government report saying, you know, climate change; these things are going to become mm -hmm. more common. So it does, and certainly this would save money in the long run. Um, I think the big question at this point is: Do it? Does it happen now, or does it happen after the election when Congress comes back? Mm -hmm. And you know, there's a great sense of urgency on the ground, obviously. But there's also, you know, a lot of the preliminary work hasn't really been done yet to figure out how this money would be allocated and what the needs are. So, well, as you said, the governor's been going up, and then other representatives too. Yes. I mean, what you're hearing, what what kind of sense are they getting? What kind of feedback are they getting? Are they getting the feeling that? Congress would be willing to help Louisiana this in the sizable amount, uh, or are they not feeling the somewhat. warmth? Somewhat. I think they're feeling some warmth. Um, certainly members are seeking, are inviting other members down to see the damage, and you're hearing people say what we've all said, which is you can't appreciate this the scope of it until yeah. you drive around. Um, it's tough. They're competing against a lot. As you know, we've been saying for weeks, this is not a storm that got the level of attention, excuse me, as Katrina. Mm -hmm. well, even in Baton Rouge, there are yeah. pockets where it's right. perfectly it's fine. normal, and then there are pockets where, where the piles are. drive and drive and drive right. in every house, and then you start to think about every family, and mm -hmm. yeah. So, um, so, so it's going to be, it's a tough fight, and it's interesting. One, one little 
kind of sub story in all of this is the governor has been going, member, our members, different mayors, Billy Nungesser, the Republican lieutenant governor, has been at the Democratic governor's side, which I think is very good. Um, Mayor Kip Holden has not been up there, and that's caused some controversy in Baton Rouge. It turns out he was on an economic development trip in Baton Rouge, in Taiwan, last week. When, far away from Baton Rouge. Far away from Baton Rouge. And he said, well, Cedric Richmond, the congressman, didn't invite him to testify. And of course, Kip Holden is running against Cedric Richmond, mm -hmm. although there really isn't anything of a campaign going on. But he's, he'll be on the ballot against Cedric Richmond. So, you know, politics always finds its way into these things. And so the question, where's Kip, is arising Where's again. Kip, yes. Yeah. OK, all right, so we'll wait and see. I know yeah. it's a very long wait for the people who have been impacted by these floods. Thanks sure. a lot, Steph. Sure. Over to Don now. And the New Orleans Public Library System, I mean, it took a real big punch with Katrina. And it's been rebuilding. And then it's, there's been some controversy, not over the system itself, but the foundation. So how are the libraries? The libraries actually, there, there's good news on many fronts. There's some bad news, some good. I'll start with the good. They say the number one question they are asked when people inquire about the libraries is when will the latter branch on St. Charles Avenue reopen? It had been shut down for renovations, opened again, shut down again last November for what was supposed to be a few month renovation project, um, upgrading the entire electrical system in the building, reworking the circulation desk. You know, this is a former grand home on St. Charles that became a library in 1948 and isn't really designed to be a library that mm -hmm. they've tried to make do with. Um, this project that was supposed to take a few months took a few more with construction delays and other day delays. It will reopen on Monday as a library, wow. open seven days a week. Um, they say they're able to be open seven days a week because of the millage that passed last spring. Um, it w the first time ever. Um, open 10 a.m. to 8 p.m. on weekdays and the different hours on the weekends. They say visits are up over 200,000 more visitors first and second quarter of 2016 versus two, first and second quarter of throughout, 2015 throughout the whole, system. Mm -hmm. throughout the whole yeah. system because of the expanded hours. The other big question the library system gets asked besides Ladder Branch is the Nora Navra Library, which is in the seventh ward, which has been shuttered since Hurricane Katrina. Groundbreaking is supposed to occur in early 2017 for that new building on St. Bernard Avenue. It should open in 2018. Another big move is the Mid-City Branch, which has been at the American Can Company. It's moving to the former auto automobile insurance building at Canal and Carrollton. That move is going to happen sometime this fall. It's a much larger facility that will enable them to have a dedicated children's room, a dedicated teen area, dedicated community space. You know, every time I talk about libraries on this show, Errol or somebody else says, who uses the libraries? And really, they have programming that goes from babies for story hours all the way up through retirement seminars and tax help and a lot of just creative programming um, that has really drawn all these expanded visitors. Um, adult coloring and wine time, history of the cocktail time. Um, and there's a lot available online as well. You can do a whole pronunciator course, online language course, learn 50 different languages through the library, or check out magazines and digital books. Um, the library, though, is not without its share of controversy as well. The whole Irvin Mayfield scandal between the um, Library Foundation and the Jazz Orchestra Foundation, I'm told, has really affected donations to the library. And not just donations to the Library Foundation, but help for Friends of the Library, which raises funding for the library through sales of books. Everybody's donations have been off and been hurt by that. Um, fortunately for the library system, at least for the capital projects, a lot of that is still FEMA money or funds from the city. Um, but, so overall, the library is doing well, but they really hope to get the message out that the Jazz Orchestra Library Foundation scandal it, it's two separate things. The libraries are up and running and serving the community and and opening and but reopening. But the foundation still serves the purpose still of accepting donations for uh, for the library use by the library system. And it's been carefully it's obviously being carefully watched now. Okay, Don. Thanks a lot. All righty, let's go back over to Stephanie now and talk a little bit of politics on yeah. our Senate race, of course, which is a very full field, mm -hmm. including David Duke. And because of that, a pack that had been formed what decades ago, twenty-five has, years, has twenty-six years yeah, actually, back when he ran for um, he ran for Senate in nineteen ninety, mm -hmm. and then governor was the big race mm -hmm. where he got into the runoff in nineteen ninety-one. And there was a group that basically did independent ads. 
Um, Larry Powell, who's a retired historian from Tulane, is very involved in this. Uh, Karen Carvin and Dito Cedar consultants. Uh, Karen's father, Jim, the late wonderful Jim yeah. Carvin, was involved way back when. And um, really memorable ads, and they're actually up on the group's website. And um, it really takes you back in time to when David Duke was a real threat. And it kind of raises the question that is really out there a lot in this race, which is, should we be worried about David Duke? Should people pay attention to David Duke? Or is he really a fringe candidate? And there are a lot of people who really want to say, you know what, that was a moment in time years ago. He's been to prison. He's defrauded his supporters, all of that. But the fact is he keeps coming up. He's getting a lot of play in the national media, even you know with the presidential race and his support of, of Donald Trump. Uh, just this weekend, there was an interview with Wolf, Wolf Flitzer of um, Trump's vice presidential nominee, Mike Pence, where he said, you know, Hillary Clinton had talked about the basket of deplorables. Is David Duke deplorable? And Mike Pence kind of declined to answer that. And that was a big dust up. So, you know, he's out there. There was a New York Times story over the weekend. It's He's out there. And there is this group that really would like to say, you know what, let's not just beat him, but let's destroy him. Let's make sure that we can go out as Louisiana after this election and say, this is not who we are. Um, and the list of, so what they're do, trying to do is raise money to run ads. Mm -hmm. So what they started off with was a list of um, supporters. And it's quite the list, I'll tell you. It's a bipartisan list. Duke, of course, is running as a Republican, but has been renounced by other Republicans. Um, start with the two other major figures in that 1991 race, Buddy Romer and Edwin Edwards. Mm -hmm. um, John Bro, former Democratic senator from Louisiana. Trent Lott, former Republican senator. Um, from, from Mississippi, Sybil yeah. Morial, the wife of, of Dutch Morial, um, James Carville, the cons political consultant. And then they've been adding names ever since. And they've added Mary Mitch Landrieu, Mary Landrieu, and an interesting one, Steve Scalise, the Republican House Majority mm -hmm. Whip, who, of course, had the, um, you know, kind of got caught having spoken to a Duke group way mm -hmm. back when. And that became a bit of a national story for him, even though he was never a Duke supporter. So, so in the Duke uh, race against uh, Edwards for yes. governor, do we remember the, the bumper sti sticker, vote, vote for, for the crook, crook. It's, it's important. important, yes. Do you envision anything like that coming out of well, this sort of we'll branding see if, that way? if they raise money. And, you know, I've spoken to them, and they've, again, they've gotten some pushback saying, why give the guy attention? But they really feel like, because there are so many candidates, there are 24, you know, the math could work out that he could sneak into the runoff. But even if he finishes in, say, fourth place, that would still be a black eye on Louisiana. So mm -hmm. they really hope to raise enough money to, um, you know, really talk about what that would mean and and go on TV. Well, and Louisiana, we'll see. it's anticipated, will go for Trump. And I know David Duke says exactly. he's sort of hoping to ride on the coattails there. Very much so. And Trump has renounced him. But there, you know, there is a feeling that some of the people who are supporting Trump may share some of these sentiments with Duke. Um, of course, it's given the other Republicans a chance to really say, you know, Duke is horrible. I renounce all racism and Nazism and all of that and kind of not really say anything about yeah. what Trump is saying <laughs> about certain people. So I don't I don't think they mind really in some ways. But so the pa pack is cranking up again. The pack is cranking up. They're trying to raise money. We, if we see ads, we'll know they're successful. Okay. All right, Steph. Thanks a lot. Let's go back over to Errol now. And um, over this past week, we observed the 15th anniversary of 9-11. It's hard to believe 15 years ago. And um, and and I know you wanted to reflect on New Orleans' role immediately after 9-11. Yeah, first of all, in the previous conversation, I want to remember our, our friend John McGinnis used to say that David Duke gets bigger the further away he is from Louisiana mm -hmm. and, and towards the end of his career. I mean, I mean, that's where he got the attention. Yeah. Uh, and if you remember the circumstances at the time, what, what put him on the map was there was an opening in the Metairie House District. And it was a short election. He was the only person with any name recognition. He won that, and that became national attention. And then there was a Senate vacancy, and because of that, having been elected, I mean, it just generated itself. It was a, it was a perfect interplay of circumstances. But ultimately, he was a 40 percent guy on the statewide right. level. But but he also did get the majority of white vote in the state, as he likes he did. to point he, out. He, he did, and you can go back and forth on that. There was, the, you know, they said they were they were arguing. At, Anti, it, it was like a conservative, liberal, anti-tax kind of thing, mm -hmm. you know, as well as race. But anyway. Okay, um, now you have a minute and a half. Okay. <laughs> um, well, the point I just wanted to make about 9-11 in New Orleans, New Orleans suffered pretty much the way the rest of the nation um, suffered during that time. But the, um, the thing that was interesting is that that year, 
the Super Bowl was scheduled for New Orleans. Uh, that February was actually delayed a week because the NFL pushed back its season a week. And so the Super Bowl that was in New Orleans, which was on February 3rd, uh, 2002, was the first big major event one day major event in the nation uh, after uh, after 9-11. And if you remember, downtown was almost a police state. Big uh, I, I remember the night before, uh, uh, jets flying around, military jets flying around all night long uh, at different levels. And so it was just a, a strange sort of mood. But New Orleans was really the test on uh, on how we could survive something like this, because if anything big was going to happen, this would be the place, uh, the place to do it. And it wasn't like past Super Bowls where there were parties all around town, and you can go. You couldn't even get downtown um, for that. But, uh, but, but, but probably if you had to have a test, the New Orleans was one of the places that was best off, that, that, that was best equipped to do it. The strange thing is that the team that won the Super Bowl for the first time ever was the Patriots, right? <laughs> and, uh, and this was at a time when patriotism, you know, I mean, the whole Super Bowl was a, a reflection in patriotism. Uh, former President uh, George Bush, the elder, even flipped a coin and it was just patriotic music. And so New Orleans really became part of the scene for the, uh, uh, for the recovery from 9-11. Right, yeah, it's good to remember that, Errol. Thanks for reminding us. Yeah. Okay. Time to look ahead. We go back so, to you. Uh, the police department is staffing, is looking for volunteers for uh, police advisory boards that it has. It has one for uh, each of the eight districts, and these are the people that are going to meet quarterly, meet with the police officials, make recommendations, not binding recommendations, but a way of getting reactions. And so it is, uh, I think, beginning Monday, uh, uh, taking recommendations and nominations from members. Okay. Jeff? Well, the uh, City Planning Commission this week uh, kicked up a series of recommendations on regulating strip clubs in the French Quarter. So uh, the City Council is going to be taking those up uh, in, in the next little bit, and we'll see, see how that goes. Okay, thanks. Done. With the reopening of the Ladder Library on Monday, they will start up again the Friends of New Orleans Public Library book sales in the carriage house behind the public library. They will start next weekend. And that's such a beautiful structure on St. Charles, it really is. Steph? Um, it's almost debate time again, I have to say. That's the true. presidential debates between Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump, they kick off a week from Monday. They're going to come pretty quickly after that, the three presidential debates and one debates and one vice presidential. So I think they're, I think a lot of people are going to watch. I think a lot of people are going to watch. It'll be very interesting. Yes. Thanks a lot for being here, you guys. Thank you all for joining us. And we, of course, want to see you again next week for Informed Sources. Have a good evening. Thanks.